Two or more gathered together here in their midst, Lord. We know that you're here. Father, have your way in this service. Lord, we're here to meet with you. We're here to meet with you. That's why we're here. Father, let us take whatever's going on in our lives. Let us focus it in on you where it rightfully belongs, Lord. It's always better. It's always better. Will you meet me here? 
Are you here this morning with that desire, nothing else, nothing else will do? Those that are viewing online, are you in that position right now that nothing else is going to do? Nothing else can do. I just want you. That's our heart's prayer, our desire, our cry for our church. It's our cry for our individual lives, that we just need Jesus more than we've ever needed him before. He's there. All we have to do is recognize his presence and invite him in to take control of our lives. This morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's remember the various needs that you might have, whether here in-house or online. If you have a special need, we want to encourage you to, uh, if you would feel comfortable in doing it, call the church office and uh, we'll be praying with you. Church prayer chain is always on the go, and a lot of people have taken advantage of that, and we thank God for those who are willing to say, call me, I'm willing to pray. And so if you're here with the need today, we want to encourage you, just turn it over to the Lord. Let God take control, and let God have his way. And let God touch you in the ways that only he can. And so let's pray that God will move by his spirit within our church, and we would see a sovereign, omnipotent, uh, move of the Holy Spirit within our church that would just um, boggle the minds of humanity. And what God can and God can will do as we commit ourselves unto Him. One request that we have received this past week is, I don't know if any is following uh, anything that is going on in Washington, but there is a there is a um, place that is coming up or a position that is coming up it's called the quality act and it's one that will have effect on a lot of our freedoms and liberties that are being removed from us it's already passed the house it now has to go into the senate but it will affect a lot of us in a lot of different ways it's totally an act of immorality and we need to pray against that we received notice from Franklin Graham to begin with. Then this past week, we received a notice from our general superintendent, Doug Clay. And then we also received notice from our district superintendent, Steve Shively. And they've all asked us as churches to pray against this thing because it will affect our church. We will come under a, a bondage that, um, that we, is, not, is not constitutionally right. And so we need to pray against that, that God would help us and give us strength. Because we're facing some very critical times. And I think we've come to the time that if we're going to leave for, live for God, we're going to have to do it. It's not going to be any mediocre. It's not going to be any mini, in between. It's either we're going to sell out or we're going to lose out. Uh, the choice is all ours. So let's pray that God would help us in this area and God's will be done within our lives. Father, this morning as we come before you, we come into your presence by the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is the Savior of all mankind. He's our healer. He's our baptizer. He's our provider. Lord, I pray that today, whatever the needs might be, whether they be in-house or online, I pray that you administer to those needs, that you would touch individual lives, I pray that you would touch bodies that are racked by pain. I pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are suffering the elements of some sickness. And I pray, God, that your touch would be upon those individuals that they would see and know the touch of God upon their lives. Lord, I pray that you would be with every need, whether it be financial, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, whatever it might be, God, we know that you are able and you are 
exceedingly to do above all that we ask or think. And so, Lord, we commit them to you. God, we would ask that you would just continue to pour out your spirit upon our church. I pray, Lord, that we would have opportunity to come back together, together, together as a church family. And we thank you, God, that you are making that possible. But, Lord, we pray that you would just move by your spirit here, that you would move by your spirit online, and that we would just sense the presence of God in a very real, in a very special way. That we would be moved from where we are to where you would have us to be. That we would experience an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Then, Lord, we pray for the for this special measure that is coming up before the, the government in the Quality Act. I pray, God, that you would just have your way. We come against that in the name of Jesus. Because we know that as we look at that, it is contrary to the morals. It is contrary to the person. It is contrary to the character of God. And Lord, we know and we thank you that even though they may be putting some stipulations on the church, yet we can stand strong and we can stand firm because you said in your word that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And God, we believe that. We stand upon it. We claim it. We profess it. And we believe that it will be done because you are the God of all creation. You are the God of all ages. And so, Lord, have your way. Now be with us this morning as we continue in this service. We thank you for the blessed spirit that is in this place. God, we are so thankful and overwhelmed by your presence. And now, God, just have your way. Minister unto us this day. Speak into our lives that which you would have for us. Through your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. We are so thankful that you came and uh, beat the elements of nature. When I woke up this morning, we knew that they were saying that we could have a little snow, but they never got us ready for what we got. And so uh, when I looked out this morning, I thought, oh dear, what are we going to do now? And so we said, well, we'll go ahead and deal with it because somebody has to be here so we can go online, if nothing else. So if there would ever be a time we couldn't have a service, we can go online. So um, so we're glad that you're here in house. And we're also glad for those who are joining us online, and we appreciate your faithfulness in co- joining with us in this area. But we know the one thing that we can be certain of is that God is building a church. He's building a church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. We do want to remind you of some things we do have upcoming. Remember our Wednesday night Bible study for the adults. This Wednesday night, we're going to begin a new study that's entitled, Don't Forget to Remember. Don't Forget to Remember. And we'll be looking into the Word of God. We'll be following a pastor by the, uh, by the name of Robert Madu, and um, you will enjoy the teaching of that time, and so we want to encourage you to come. Youth, of course, will be meeting. There will be kids uh, programs that are in operation for the children that would uh, come and be a part of that as well. We just want to use that as a family night. Then we have coming up in the, a couple weeks on the 10th of March is our annual business meeting, and we need a quorum, and so please come out and be a part of that annual business meeting. If you're concerned about social distancing, you don't have to worry about it. We'll spread out all over the place, and we'll make do with what we have, and we just want you to be a part of seeing what God is going to do and God is doing. And We just thank God for his presence. I thank the Lord for our worship team. And they, they do good, you know. Where would we be? I always say they are the ones that open the door into the throne room, and we enter into it in this time of the consideration of the Word. This morning, I just want to ask a very simple question. How many are humble? Today, we have a video that's going to introduce us to this theme that we're going to be looking at this morning.
humility, the act of being humble. That's why I asked the question, how many of us are humble? And um, I didn't notice any hands, and I didn't look because um, we would be praying for you if you did. Because it's something that we can all work on, the area of humility within our hearts and our lives. Now, what we're doing in the in the in this course of of the series that we're involved in, we're looking at very characteristics of Christ, because we want to become to know Him more. We not we want to know Him more intimately. We want to know Him more personal within each one of our lives, and to know Him in that way is to see the way the Holy Spirit will reveal Him to us through His Word. And so this is the course of study that we are involved in, is we want to come to the point of saying, I want more. I want more. I want to know you more. One of the characteristics of Jesus that we don't um, notice a lot, talk a lot about, because if I were to ask the question, what do you think of the most when you think, about Jesus. What do you think about the most when you think about Jesus? I'm sure some of us would say, well, I think about his healing power. I think about how he can touch the lame and and cause them to walk. He can cause the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. I, I think about how he can raise the dead. I think about all of his power of how he can walk on the water, how he can feed. 5,000 men with a couple loaves and uh, five loaves, two fish. I think about that personality of Jesus. But have we ever stopped to think about the humility of Jesus? Jesus was an example of what we're talking about this morning, the area of humility. On this screen, we saw that there is a kingdom that God is bringing us into, And I like the way that one person put it. It is an upside-down kingdom. It is an upside-down kingdom. It is a kingdom that says, do you want to be exalted? You must humble yourself. If you want to live, you must die. If you want to be the greatest, you must become the least. An upside-down kingdom. And when we look at the 33 years that Jesus Christ walked upon the earth, we can see that he demonstrated this principle in his life. And not only did he demonstrate it, and he displayed it through the word of God for us, now he is calling us to demonstrate the same attitude, the same spirit. As he demonstrated the area of humility, He first demonstrated it by coming to earth from heaven. And then we not only find him coming from earth to heaven, we find him as we're going to see in our text in John chapter 13 a little bit, that that we're not only finding him coming from earth as the Son of God, coming God uh, born in the flesh, but he came and he knelt before the disciples and he washed their feet. That's humility. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, knelt before his disciples, and even the one betrayed him, knelt before the disciples and washed their feet. That is the picture of humility. And if we want the world to recognize Christ in us, we have to demonstrate his character. We have to demonstrate his attitude. We have to exercise humility. John chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, is the account that I was referring to, where the Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. After supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. 
Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What, what am I doing? You do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you will have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he washed their feet, then took his taken his garment and sat down again and said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Jesus here set a tremendous example of what humility is all about. There's a story that is told of a rider who was riding across the country and he saw a few soldiers that were tearing it and they were toiling trying to move a big log out of the way and they were doing everything in their power and they just couldn't move it. And there was another individual sitting on his ride over here watching the man coil and tried to move this big log and yet to no avail. The rider of the other horse came up to the individual and and said to that individual, aren't you going to help him move the log? And the individual said, no, I'm the corporal. I give the order. I give the war, war. I give the command. And you know, it's the opposite. And so what did he do? The rider of a horse that came up and the colonel that said that I am the colonel and I am the one who gives the order, the man who came up as a rider got off of his ride, went over to the people that were trying to move the log and helped them move the log. And with him and with the others, they were able to move the log. You know who that was? George Washington, the president of the United States, commander-in-chief. A colonel was sitting there, no, I'm the colonel. I'm not going to do anything to help in anything because I'm the one who gives the orders. But president George Washington got off of his ride and helped the individuals move the log. And maybe there are times in our lives when we act more like the corporal, more like that individual than we would like to admit. We are called as believers to be humble. We are called to be humble. We have one of our friends that had a license plate that said, I am the greatest. It's totally opposite of what the character of God would denounce unto us as being humble. In order to be humble, we have to be helpful. We have to think of others more than we think of ourselves. I think of an example of our granddaughter, Kaylee. It's been a few years ago, and, and we had just finished eating, and I, I don't remember what the setting was, but she began to clean up the plates and, and to do away with the plates and uh, take care of them, and, and she just went about doing all the busy work while we sat there and visited. We made comment to Kaylee, you know, we appreciated what you were doing and what, how you're helping out. And she gave us the word as a child. She said, it is my pleasure to serve. And I wonder how many times some of us as adults need to get that same attitude embedded within our lives because that's the attitude of Christ. It is my privilege and my pleasure to be able to serve. But this morning we want to look at the example of Jesus Christ. The example that he had of humility as he sets before us that example. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God humbled himself, and he conquered death so that we might experience life. If we want to live, we have to die. If we want to be exalted, we must be in in, in, um, lowliness and being brought down to ourselves. It is an upside-down kingdom, but that's the kingdom that Jesus came to demonstrate. And he came as an example 
I appreciated that story that when I read it concerning George Washington because here he was, the one that you would think they would be saying, Sir, how can we help you? Rather, he was saying, What can I do to help these that are trying to move this log and cannot get the job done? And so we look at that example, and I appreciate it so very much, that attitude, but I really, really appreciate the reality of the example of Jesus Christ because Jesus gives us an example of what it looks like to be humble. What does it look like to be humble? We humble ourselves and we serve others. We're here for service. Notice what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. He said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Here Paul was just simply encouraging us as believers to do nothing more than to be like Christ, is to be like Jesus, to be that same of that same attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ. Let your actions and let your reflections be seen in you, which bring you an acknowledgement to who Jesus is and what Jesus deny, desires for us to be. It is our desire to be like Jesus. We might say, well, you know, that's a pretty tall order. That's a pretty tall order. Jesus is the Son of God, sinless, perfect, without sin, totally holy. And yet we're called to be like Jesus. And we may be saying that's a lot easier said than done because we recognize we're talking about the very Son of the living God. But notice Paul goes on in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8, and he gives us a list of attitudes and actions that we should model. He said, who being in the form of God, Jesus being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now look at that. It says that he was a son of God. He had come down from God, being in the form of God. But it said now he would come down. He has been found in the very appearance of man, and he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That is the humility of Jesus Christ. And Jesus now said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So how do we allow that to be done in our lives? We need to learn not to take advantage of our position and not take advantage of other people. We don't elevate our position. We recognize all of us and each one of us have need. And Jesus had all the power in the world. He had every opportunity that he needed to use his position as an advantage. But instead, he laid it aside. That's humility. He could have come and he could have lifted and elevated and exalted himself into being that place of which he would be worthy to receive, but he didn't. He robbed himself, he ripped himself of that, and took upon himself the form of man. He served others. Jesus served others. When Christ laid aside his royal position, he chose to become a servant. Throughout all of his ministry, you find Jesus giving himself to meet the needs of others. He had touched lives, he had touched individuals in so many different ways because the Bible says over and over and over again that he was moved with compassion. He had compassion, he had love for those that were around him and his desire was to serve others. He laid aside all of his royal position and he chose to become a servant. 
And throughout all of his earthly ministry, Jesus gave himself to meet the needs of others. But not only did he meet the needs of others, Jesus was willing, in order to humble himself, was willing to give his life away. Jesus' humility ultimately led him to the cross. He left the splendor of glory, knowing his destiny. And yet he came from earth, from glory to earth, to take upon himself the cross of Calvary, so that we who are dead might receive life. And yet now Jesus says that he desires that we have his likeness. And how many times have we sung that old hymn, Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like Jesus, that is our desire, that is our heart's cry. But are we willing to give our life in order to be like in his likeness, in a life of servanthood, in a life of obedience, in a life of serving, serving others? He literally gave his life away. He was not willing to hold on to his life. He could have held on to his life. But when he walked the, toward the hill called Golgotha, he knew that there was one thing that was going to be that was going to be there for him, and that was the ultimate torment and the anguish of his death. But he, in obedience to the Father, remember what Jesus said, Father, if it be willing, if you be willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. In other words, Jesus is saying, God, I'm selling out into obedience. What you want me to do, I will do, even though it means going to the cross of Calvary. That's humility. That is humility. He deserved to be worshipped. He deserved to be praised. He didn't deserve to be denounced and deserved to be hung upon a cruel cross of Calvary. He could have held on to his life, but he gave it. And I wonder how many times in our lives we hang on to things that take us away from being like Jesus, that take us from being in his likeness, demonstrating and exhibiting his life in us and through us. Because, you know, one thing that we need to recognize about humility, humility is not as much a destination to be reached as an attitude to be embraced. Humility is not a destination to be reached. It is an attitude to be braced. We come into that attitude of Christ, and humility is that attitude of living for God. And it is giving ourselves unto God. Why? Because Jesus set the example. He gave us his example. He's not asking us anything to do anything he didn't do. He set the example. And yet we look at humility because humility is a big deal. How many of you watch football games and you see somebody that does something good? What do they do? They go, you know, look at me. There's my number. You go look at my number. Or you watch a basketball game and somebody hits a three-pointer. They go down the field or before with three points in their, or three fingers up as they just hit a three-pointer. Again, look at me. Draw your attention to me. I remember years ago there was a boxer, and you, uh, some of you remember that boxer by the name of Muhammad Ali, Cassius, Cassius Clay. What was his big statement that he made? He always made, I am the greatest. I am the greatest. You know, they make this claim and they demonstrate this claim. And in all reality, it is a total contrast to what God is desiring us for, to do. So humility, yes. Humility is a big deal. Because it was evidenced in the life of Christ and in a number of different times and in, in, in a number of different places. The Bible tells us that we are to be used in humility, and the opposite of humility is pride. And so the Bible very explicitly says there is a place of humility. If you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. But on the other hand, it talks about the other extreme, and that is the area of pride. 
Bible says there is an exaltation as far as humility is concerned, but there is destruction as far as the nature of pride is concerned. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 tells us, Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We've all heard that verse. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Before a fall. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, All of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You see the extreme. God resists the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. Another extreme, or another scripture that I think is very noteworthy, it says, the scripture says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The scripture is there. What is the opposite of humility is pride. And we see the, the warning concerning pride. And it even goes further how God opposes the proud when he give, and he gives grace to the humble. In Psalm 138, verse 6, Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. I thought, man, that, that is quite a scripture of the New Living Translation. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Now notice in that scripture, that psalm, God distances himself from those who are prideful. And that is quite an, a, a statement to be made and quite a statement to look at and to understand because we find out very quickly that pride and humility are totally incompatible. You can't have one and not the other. You can't have one and the other as well. They're, they're, not, they're just in totally incompatible. They can't work hand in hand and go as what God would have us to be. Pride will destroy us. Scripture says that pride comes before a fall. Pride will destroy us. Humility will bring us up to the place of exaltation in the eyes of God and recognition by others that we are living the life that God has designed for us to live and we are representing Christ to the best of our ability as we see God working in us and through us. But notice, if you will, in John chapter 13, verses 15 through 17, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. He just washed the disciples' feet. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are ye who do them. And so he said, you know, it, it's been shown, I've shown you, now it is up to you to take this. It's an object lesson. He said, I've given you an object lesson, and now what you do with it is totally up to you. You can live, leave in pride and in arrogance and fall into the hand of destruction, or you can leave in humility and, and humbleness and find that God is going to stay by yourself because he said that you will be blessed if you do them. But what that is telling us this morning, church, is if we would walk and we work in a humility, we're going to be blessed. If we humble ourselves before God and try and not try to exalt ourselves above others and try to place ourselves into a prominent role within our lives or within our, our affairs of our life, if we will yield ourselves in humility, God said he will exalt us. He will lift us up. He will bring us into the place where God will be glorified. God will be honored. And when God is glorified and God is honored, we too find that pleasure of representing him in this way. But it takes humility of saying, I'm looking at the other needs of others. Yeah, I have needs of my own. I remember one of the first lessons that Christianity, well, I shouldn't say Christianity, I was raised. I was born in the church almost. Uh, my mom and dad told me I went to the church 
short few days after I was born and been there ever since. But I remember one time we would just got into our first ministry, our first pastorate. And there was something, and I don't remember what it was, but I said, you know, I'd appreciate you if you would pray for me. I really have a need within my life, and I, I just need your prayer. I was greeted at the back door by one of the elderly ladies of the church. And you know what her encouragement to me was? You don't need to tell us about your problems. We have problems of our own. And I thought, man, God, are you, are you sure you called me into the ministry? I thought, man, what an attitude. But you know, sometimes we don't want to be bothered by others. We don't want to be called upon when it's inconvenient. But church, there are times we have to be inconvenient. There has to be times when we get out of our, our, our box and we become inconvenient to meet the needs of others. I can tell you, I, I, don't, didn't re, I didn't really enjoy the time. I got called at 4 o'clock in the morning to come to the jail and to deal with an individual who was demon-possessed. But there was a need there. And I was the one that they called upon to come and, and minister, touch that individual, and through God's touch, it was totally an inconvenience. I could have said, man, this is Saturday night. I've got church in the morning, and I need to be wide awake for church. And so why don't you call somebody else? Maybe you could call Brother So-and-so. He's a deacon of the church. He can do it for us, and maybe he can do it. But you see what it says? Sometimes we have to be inconvenient. And to go ahead and meet the needs of someone else. Maybe we have to give a little bit of something. Maybe a, a time. Maybe just a listening ear. You know what I found out in counseling? Not everyone that calls with the need is seeking advice. They just want somebody to listen to them. They just want somebody that will hear them out. And it will be amazing how that time when you when you hear them out and they say, man, I feel so much better already. And you sit back and say, I didn't do anything. I just sat here and listened to them. But it was because you gave yourself to hear the need of someone else. You're willing to be inconvenient. You're willing to listen. And maybe there is a time when you see a need financially and you, you feel led by the Spirit of God to give toward that financial need. And and you reach out. There's no greater pleasure than to do that. I remember we were walking in. I don't even remember what city it was, but there was a gentleman standing by the wall. And you know, we we always try. To, I always try to keep my hand out of my pockets when we're going through a city because you know they they hear the jingle of coins and they know you have some money. And um, so we were walking by this gentleman and and. Um, he was asking for some help financially, and, and we walked on by and said, no, thank you, you just can't do it. And we walked just a little ways, and I looked at my wife. I said, hon, I've got to go back and give him some money. Now, you don't know what they're going to do with it. I always say it's up to me to do what God wants me to do. What they do with it's up to them. But I went back to this gentleman and I handed him some cash and I just said, here, sir, here's some money for you. And he said, thank you. I want, I haven't had lunch. He took that money, he made a beeline to McDonald's and he bought lunch. You talk about a sense of fulfillment in my spirit. Why? Because it was something that I wasn't conveniently involved in, but yet the need was there. And so I wanted to meet the need. And I'm just using it as an example because of what I've done, what, what I've gone through, and the relief that it has set forth in my mind to know that I have given of my time, I have given of my talent, I have given of my resources to meet the needs of others, and the blessing that God brings upon my life because of the willingness that we might have in serving others. Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And if you can just imagine that day, that night, here he is with his disciples sitting, reclined at the table, ready for the Passover. And there they are. Jesus gets up, 
takes off his garment, puts a towel around his waist, gets a basin, fills it with water. And he comes and does the unthinkable. He kneels at the feet of his disciples. And he washed the feet of the disciples. Now that is a very lowly and a very humble act of service. Because in those days, the feet were considered the most dirty and the most unclean part of the human body because they walked in sandals. They walked on dust roads, dirt roads, and the dust and everything that would build up. And yet Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, bowed before him and washed the disciples' feet. I'll tell you one thing that I do know. At that time, the disciples knew how much he loved them. They knew how much he loved them. Why? Because he gave them an example of humility. He gave them, and that was just the beginning of what he was going to do because shortly thereafter, he was going to go to the cross of Calvary and give his life for all of us. And that was an act of humility. He didn't have to, but he did. He gave his life, bled his blood for us, and set us free from the penalty of sin and of death. He took the position of a simple house servant and washed the feet of the disciples. The house servant could have been doing that. But Jesus took that position and he washed the feet of the disciples because he cared for them and because he loved them. He demonstrated a heart that should be characteristic and demonstrated in the heart of a believer. And so this morning, as we close, do you really want to be like Jesus? Do you really want to be like Jesus? There's a chorus that we used to sing, and I'm going to close with this chorus. But it's a chorus that we used to sing, and I think it is so so representative of what we're talking about now, and that is being like Jesus. And that is, if you want to be like Him, you have to become a servant. The, chorus, the old chorus says, Lord, make me like You. Please make me like You. You are a servant. Make me one too. Are you willing to make that prayer and your desire? Lord, make me like you. Please make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Father, this morning, we thank you for the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord of lords. The King of kings. The Alpha, the Omega the beginning and the end. The one who came and took upon himself the sin of the world that we might have life. We might have it more abundantly. Lord Jesus, you knew that night of what was before you of the cruel cross of Calvary, the hideous death that you were going to die. But you were not concerned about your own affairs. You were not concerned about your own things that were going on in your life. But you took the act of humility. You bowed before the disciples and washed their feet. And now you say to us, you've seen the example. Go thou and do likewise. Father, help us to serve others. Help us to be servants, not only always wanting to be served, but wanting to serve. Not asking what others could do for us, but what can we do for others? How can we help? How can we be of service? What can we be doing involving others that they would see the likeness and the image of Christ in us? Lord, truly today, it is my desire And I trust it is our desire that we become more like Jesus. More like Jesus. Father, make us like you. That the love of God might abound within our lives and others that see us would see your love 
because of our acts of service. Lord Jesus, I just pray your blessings to be upon your people. I pray, God, that we would live in accordance to your word and according to your will, that your name might be glorified, that you might be exalted above all else, and others would see the reflection of your image in us. And for this, Lord, we pray and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this evening, or this morning, if you will. Thank God that He's given us this opportunity to serve Him. Opportunity to be conformed to His image. That should be all of our desires. This morning as we dismiss, we do want to remind you of the giving. We do have available the baskets in the back if you want to give. Uh, personally, today before you leave, just drop your your gift or your offering in the basket in the back. If you want to give online, you can give online. Go to the church's website, and you can give in that way, or you can go by way of the smartphone and give in that way, or you can um, give through Tithely, the Tithely app, and give in that way. Whichever way you give, we want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your willingness to give in despite of being separated and distant. Yet you're willing to give, and we thank you for it. And God will bless you richly for it. And so let's go today. Let's go with the idea that we're going to be a servant. We're going to be a servant. Can I share this one little tidbit with you before we go? We were going to be a servant. You know, everybody says, pay the, the, for the one behind you. We pulled up to Dairy Queen one night, and I said, you know, let's do that tonight. Let's pay for the one behind us. And so we did. We pulled up, and we said, um, we also want to pay for the one that was behind us. And they said, well, that'll be 30-some dollars. <laughs> Not really what we anticipated. So uh, Donna said, I'll give 15. If you give 15, we gave 15. But you know what that little thing does? I remember the day that I pulled up and bought an ice cream cone, or we did. Bought an ice cream cone, we got up to get it. The, the cashier said, it's already been paid for by the person that wants the one behind you. Acts of service. Let's look for ways to serve this coming week. God bless you. Pastor Jeremy, just leading the chorus in this place. <laughs>